Guitar Business Radio is the podcast for the business of guitar, where you'll always get no reviews, no demos, and no idle chatter. From players to CEOs and in between, if you have a professional or business connection to the world of guitar, this show is your window to insight and information you won't get anywhere else. I'm Jeffrey D. Brown, and I approve this message. So let's get to it. From Guitar Business Media, welcome to the 58th episode of GBR. We have another unique and original show for you today where we'll be talking about the business of tribute bands and more with our guest, Jason Fellman, who's built a thriving music business in the Pacific Northwest with his company, J. Fell Presents. It's a fascinating and fast-moving interview, so hang on to your seats, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But first, just a very, I promise, very brief plug for episode three of GBR Focus, which actually comes out in just a few days, if not sooner, depending on when you're listening to this episode, of course. It may have already happened, but in any case, we'll be focusing on an iconic company that's been in business over 50 years, and I'm guessing will probably be known to virtually all of you. So I'm not giving it away. I mean, we have to add some kind of suspense and anticipation in order to create a certain amount of drama around the release. Gotta have the drama. Also, you know, on a personal note, I, I just want to thank some of you because obviously not all of you sent me well wishes for my birthday last week. You probably didn't get the memo, I understand, but it's the thought that counts. It, it just doesn't count as much as the actual wish, but it counts for something. In any case, it was a great day, and there were a lot of surprises, most of them good. In fact, it was so good that I placed an application at the government's Office of Birthday Management for a two-week extension. And to my additional surprise, well, it was approved. So, looks like my birthday is officially extended till pretty much the end of the month. So, while you're trying to figure out exactly what to do with that information, we'll just advance token to something completely different. Well, my guest on GBR today is Jason Fellman. He's deep in the music business based out of Portland, Oregon. His company, J. Fell Presents, produces festivals, books and manages dozens of tribute and cover bands and others. He plays multiple instruments in two successful bands that he also manages. He's involved in several ongoing programs to help other musicians develop their business skills and improve their careers. And of course, there's much more. So let's just get to it as Jason Fellman joins us right here and right now. Hey, Jason, thanks so much for taking the time uh, to join us today from Portland, Oregon. Welcome to GBR. Hey, thanks so much. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, all kinds of things with you and your listeners today. It's going to be great. Well, I'm I'm really um, thrilled, and I, I want to do a quick shout out to uh, uh, Jennifer Batten, our mutual acquaintance, who uh, was on our 50th episode, what we called the golden first anniversary episode. Great interview, and she's a a terrific person, and uh, she uh, connected up us, and uh, I had a chance to to find out a lot more about you and what you're doing. What an amazing thing is going on in the Northwest of the United States. Uh, we talk a lot about tribute bands and that sort of thing, which I think is uh, going to be really interesting to our listeners. But we kind of have this thing on GBR. We like to to get a little sense of uh, sort of the foundations of people. We want to, you know, find out a little bit about what got them to where they are today. And, you know, part of that story comes from your youth. Uh, you know, so what would you say were some of the most impactful events that, uh, you know, growing up that uh, influenced you later in your professional career? Yeah, I mean, I think there were three things that really, uh, you know, sent me down the musical path. One of them is, you know, like many people, I was born into a musical family. Uh, my grandmother was a professional concert pianist. Uh, my father and his siblings are all uh, really great musicians. My dad plays guitar and my brother plays guitar. And, you know, really the first thing for me was being around all of that as a child, you know, watching my brother learn how to play. He's older than me by a few years. You know, the second thing was... When I bought my first Rush album, 
um, which was moving pictures. And I was just, you know, like a lot of people who are Rush fans, you know, you kind of hear it for the first time. There's something about it that resonates and says, wow, I'd like to make music like this someday. Of course, later on, you find out that if you want to make a living doing music, going down the Rush path isn't exactly the path of least resistance. But um, but it was big for me. You know, it, was, it was the musical inspiration for me, along with Led Zeppelin. Those two bands, you know, I just listened to that. And I just remember thinking, man, I want to like play every instrument on here. This just sounds so cool. Um, and I was really moved by it. And, and uh, uh, how old were you at that time? Um, I was uh, sixth grade, so it'd be about 12. Okay. And then the, the, the third, sort of the final linchpin was uh, my brother uh, had a, a friend slash guitar teacher when he was in high school and I was in junior high school. And uh, I would sit in and watch these lessons. And uh, the guitar teacher, his name is Davin, uh, and he, uh, I, I was just like, he was one of these guys who had just amazing technique. Uh, he was on his way to GIT and I was kind of watching this all take place and I was really moved by, you know, all the, you know, by music theory and, and watching those lessons. And finally, what ended up happening is that uh, at the time I had already started playing drums and uh, Davin's band ended up looking for a drummer. And so, you know, without going into too much detail about that story, I ended up the drummer in my brother's guitar teacher's band. Oh, and, from there, okay. and, and that was when I was in. Uh, that that was later on when I was in high school, around 16. Right. So I was a 16 year old playing with, um, you know, some some guys who were probably about four or five old, years older than me. And, uh, you know, I really enjoyed the live performance experience. And that was kind of what solidified it for me. So I knew, you know, probably, you know, early high school years that this was the path I wanted to go down. Got it. Got it. So you you kept sort of doing that through school and you, you get out of school. Uh, what happens then? Yeah, so I graduate high school. I go to PIT, so Musicians Institute in uh, California, where I uh, study drums. That was my thing. But while I was there, um, I also uh, used the opportunity to uh, hone my guitar and my vocal skills and even bass playing skills because there were so many resources there. Um, so, you know, I, I ultimately, although I, I did, you know, most of my edu formal education there was around drums, I left there with a a very well-rounded music education and an appreciation of sort of all the ensemble rock ensemble instruments. And so when I left there, um, I, after I graduated, I moved back to Portland and I did the quote unquote band thing right. uh, for, for a couple <laughs> years. And that was uh, my first real dose of musical reality of what the business side of music was like. And, you know, within about two years, I had gone from, man, this is awesome. I'm going to we're going to go sign a record deal and be famous to Wow, I'm living in my mom's basement. This sucks. <laughs> That's isn't that funny that you say that with today? We hear that so many, many times yeah. uh, about today, sort of generational. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and and you know it's funny. So you know, essentially, I gave it up uh -huh. and I moved to uh, Austin, Texas, to uh, to go to University which, of Texas, which is not a slouchy music uh, town, is it? <laughs> no, no. And then the funny thing is, I, I, you know, I didn't know much about Austin. I had just been there to visit a friend of mine who was already going to University of Texas. And I just really liked the vibe and it was something different. And um, I didn't even necessarily know what I wanted to study. I, I entered as a physics major, um, but I was taking mostly radio, television, film classes. And uh, yeah, that's um, what I did in college. Fun. So the interesting thing <laughs> is that while I was there during the first semester, I met a fella who was because um, I was old for my dorm. I was in a freshman dorm, but I was 21. So it was a little oh. weird. So I ended up being coming friends with the RA, the resident assistant, who was more my age. Yeah. And uh, he was this sort of computer genius type. And um, we became friends. And he uh, came to me one day in our lunchroom. This is a crazy story. And he drew a diagram for me about a product idea. And what it was, and this is back in 1994. So um, what he drew for me was a device that would essentially automate the process of making a bead necklace. Bead necklaces are tend to be in vogue every 30 years, 60s, <laughs> 90s, right. and they'll be and they'll be in again in the 2020s. Yeah. Back on it. <laughs> and so he had this idea that was sort of it functioned kind of like a label maker, and you would you know you swirl the thing around and the 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 beads would drop on a string, so on and so forth. It was a really cool idea. And he said, hey, man, you want to, you know, this is just, you know, young guys being silly. Hey, you want to make a business out of this with me? You want to do this? I'm like, yeah, man, that sounds awesome. Because that's what you do when you're 21. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, we got really serious about this product. And we started, you know, doing some research about what it would take to bring the product to market. And of course, neither one of us had any business experience around anything. So um, we ended up determining that in order to, you know, effectively market the product, we had to build a prototype. 
Well, we met with a manufacturing consultant, and it turns out to build the prototype of this thing would cost around $150,000. Wow. So it, enter the new mission. We got to get $150,000 so we can build the prototype so that we can, you know, become rich with this you know, great product idea, right? Well, so the, we started another, we started a business designed to get the money to build the prototype. Now okay. that business, um, over the course of about six months, we, you know, we tinkered in a bunch of different ideas around IT consulting, setting up networks, doing multimedia. I mean, all kinds of things that we didn't really know how to do, but they sounded like good ideas. Um, but somewhere in there through a sort of a series of flukes and, you know, trial and error and hard work and determination, we landed on a business that actually ended up being a, 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 a good idea, which was we, 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 we focused on interactive marketing. And keep in mind that in 1994, when we started this thing, that was the first year that the, the graphical user interface showed up on the Internet. And, we the, using, and the word interactive, that was right about the time that the, that term was being used a lot. I remember that I was right in the thick of it. Yeah, uh, it was the beginning. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so, you know, our, you know, the Internet really wasn't the core business at that time. Our mm -hmm. whole thing was we were doing CD-ROMs. Mm -hmm. But while the rest of the industry was focused on CD-ROMs for education and entertainment, we immediately focused on business to business communications. And so over, over the course of time, that business evolved to a place where we were one of the most recognized firms in the world. We were a member of the New Media 500, along with companies like AT&T and Disney. Um, we had, you know, global 1000 clients all over the world. You know, we had Shell in the Netherlands. We had clients in um, like Hitachi and Canon and Tokyo Electron in Japan, 50 employees. Um, and we, we were doing everything from enterprise collaboration software to, uh, you know, videos for DreamWorks. And so, um, you know, I ran that business as the CEO for about nine and a half years and um, through a series of sort of, you know, personal evolution and a desire to get back to the Northwest and, um, and having just survived the downturn and bouncing back from it. Right. Um, the time was right for me to kind of switch gears and do something different. So I ended up uh, about at the same time my wife uh, had uh, graduated medical school in uh, Houston and, or my fiance at the time. And uh, we uh, decided to move back to Portland where she got her residency. And so I phased out of my company um, and my shares and sold my shares back to my partners um, over the course of a couple of years. And so during that time, um, I was back in Portland. We had bought a house. I was doing consulting for my old business and I had a lot of time on my hands and I had a musical itch that had not been scratched. Yeah. So you <laughs> started down that musical path early on and I got sidetracked for 10 years, um, you know, doing that other business. And during that time, I didn't have a lot of time to focus on drums, but I played a lot of guitar during that time and really developed my guitar playing skills during that time. So um, when I moved back to Portland, you know, I had a, a couple of what I would sort of consider bucket list goals. One of them was that I wanted to record, you know, uh, my own album. I want my own album, my own songs. And so, you know, I started up an original band and um, worked the process, did the album. And another one of my goals was to do an album release. And I'd really mod, you know, an album release show, which, again, in retrospect, doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But at the time, you know, it was a really big goal for me. And I had a specific venue. There was a 50 Per, or 75 capacity venue here in Portland called the Buffalo Gap. It's still here. And that was the place I was like, I dreamed of having my album release at the Buffalo Gap and all that. So anyway, I did those things. Um, and I started my original band and started playing out. And I did my album release. And I, I made um, some interesting discoveries in the process. And the discoveries were as follows. One of the discoveries was that as an original artist, um, if you're trying to play in club situations where a club wants to have, you know, they want to cover that nine p.m. to 1 a.m. span of music. Yeah, that's really hard. As First of all, if you're an original band, I don't care if you're Tom Petty. You know, what I mean, I, I, nobody can play hits for four hours. You no. know, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. And so, you know, we were I was sort of stuck in a situation where I'm like, well, if I want to be able to play my bandmates, I can't have four bands on the bill and have us all play for an hour. But I also can't play all night because we don't have enough material. And even if we did, no one would stick around for it. So obviously, like a lot of original bands do in that situation, we moved to covers. But rather than putting the covers in the set, what I did was I played two sets of original music, two one-hour sets. And then the third one-hour set, we played all 80s music. And the reason we did that and the reason we did that in the third set is we thought, well, maybe people will stick around for the 80s set. 
you know, yeah, stay around all night. Interesting idea. How did that work? And, um, and especially because at the Buffalo Gap and a lot of other places, your revenue was tied to your income was tied to how much revenue the club brought in. Okay. It was a no cover venue. So you had to generate sales, which means you had to keep people there. So they would spend money so you could make money. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it was weird because it really worked. Like people totally stuck around for this. The second thing I learned as an outgrowth of that is I learned that what I truly loved was performing. I was having more fun performing those 80s covers than I was playing my own music. Oh, how and I had also discovered during the writing and recording process that I not only am I not a particularly strong writer, I don't actually enjoy the process of recording uh, and all. You know, yeah. It just wasn't for me. Yeah. And, um, you know, it kind of rocked my world a little bit because I'm like, wow, you know, I kind of thought that, you know, this is what musicians did. You you write your music and you go play it. And that's what a musician with integrity does, you know. <laughs> and uh, I was kind of one of those kind of, you know, thinkers. And then it really opened my eyes to the fact that I preferred performance over my original stuff. Yeah. And so that matched up with the market demand. So what we ended up doing is I ended up forming an 80s cover band, an 80s tribute band, if you will. Um, playing all 80s music. And that was the beginning of my journey as a musician in the cover band world. Okay. So we launched this cover band and it, it's, it's all, I, won't, I don't want to say it was like successful overnight, but it was pretty darn close. You know, there wasn't another 80s cover band in town at the time. And this is um, still in Portland? Still in Portland, yeah. yep. Okay. And um, our timing was good. Um, and, uh, you know, I had the right people in the band. We were a good band. And so, um, you know, that started evolving and, you know, maybe you know, two or three years into it while we were uh, maybe two years into it. Somehow we were hanging out at the recording studio of our friend Kevin Hahn, who's one of the more established recording uh, studio guys here in Portland, um, as well as a very well established a lead guitar player here in town. He's sort of one of the Portland bigwigs. And uh, someone was holding a guitar and I think they were playing like uh, Lights by Journey. Mm hmm. On the guitar and all of a sudden kevin starts singing the song and we're all everybody in the room just like what we all stopped and listened and we're like holy cow kevin sounds like steve perry <laughs> <laughs> you know it was like this crazy thing we weren't expecting and we knew kevin was a good backup singer but he had never been a lead vocalist so then we start joking around about this idea we're like dude we should totally have a journey tribute that's <laughs> called a journey tribute you know we're just kidding around so yeah. we're like hey that sounds fun so we went and rallied a bass player, and I moved back to drums for this thing because Kevin was the singer, um, and I can't play Journey on the guitar anyway. I'm not a good lead guitar player. I'm a rhythm guitar player uh, by trade. And so um, we did this thing, and we did a five. We learned five Journey songs, and we tacked it on to the end of one of our 80s songs. We did that same thing. We said, at the end of the night, if you stick around to the end, you're going to get the Journey. So we did, and everybody stuck around. It was a full, it was a club gig, and everybody stuck around. And the place just went bananas when so, we did those. So this drinks. was the same 80s cover band? Yes. Okay. Got same it. Same 80s cover band. Um, and so from that, we played these five Journey songs. And after that, we're like, wow, I guess this, there's something to this. So then we decide, okay, well, let's learn five more songs. You know, we'll get ourselves a little 45, you know, 50 minute set. And uh, we did that. And then our next show we did was just when we, we built it as Stone in Love, which is the name of our Journey tribute. And it was, it was, it was bonkers again. And so at that point, that was the beginning of Stone and Love Journey Tribute, which is the most popular Journey Tribute in the Northwest. It's the most popular tribute band in the Northwest and the cornerstone of, of I guess, my sort of tribute band cabal or you yeah. know, some people joke. They say my Northwest tribute band empire. I think yeah, that's a little, yeah. well, it's, it's a little bit grandiose, but I like the humor. In it and it's too. an interesting so, business where I know we're going to talk more about it. But uh, yeah. so, so so what what happened from there? Well, from there, so now all of a sudden we've got this tribute band and um, some of the other, there were tribute bands already. Obviously, we did not invent the tribute band. Right, there right. were other tribute bands around who have been around long before us. You know, most of them were either, you know, legacy, legacy Vegas type acts like, you know, Elvis, Bette Midler types, or they were like really heavy, like, uh, you know, Judas Priest or, or that kind of thing, which again, which is awesome. But there wasn't necessarily a mainstream, you know, sort of mainstream, what I call soccer mom rock Um you know, tribute scene. And so what happened was we had, uh, we had been selling out pretty much, well, no, we sold out every show and we pretty much do still. But what happened is some of the other tribute bands started taking notice of this and reached out to me. And one in particular, these guys in Appetite for Deception, which is a, a next level, awesome Guns N' Roses tribute. They, they actually have appeared on that TV show, uh, World's Greatest Tribute Bands. I mean, mm -hmm. they're just supremely authentic and candidly, a much better band than, than our own, right? Yeah. We all acknowledge that these guys are better than us, right? It was no ego. Yet they were playing these gigs that were, you know, 
unbefitting uh, a, a band at that level. They were playing these small club dates and they weren't making any money. And they asked if I could, you know, maybe help do for them what I had done for our own band. And at that point, I had never considered promoting another band that I wasn't in. I was just focused on the two bands that I was in. Um, but I thought it would be a great learning experience to take that on. And, you know, if I wasn't, you know, one of the things about being a promoter and a musician in the same show is it's, it's exhausting. Um, yeah, you know, the day of show is, um, you know, cause you're worried about the business end of things. And so I, I took on the project and we did a show together and we sold out the venue. It was a 600 capacity Aladdin theater and we sold out the show. And, and at this point it was the final piece, um, that, that I learned about, which is that when I looked around the audience of that Guns N' Roses show, I saw that maybe, you know, 30% of the audience was the same people that we had at the Stone and Love show at the same venue. Mm. And that's when the light bulb went off. Ah. I mean, it should have been obvious, but it never really occurred to me that all these tribute bands have overlapping audiences. And there was an opportunity to potentially develop a scene, not around the bands so much, but around the audiences of the bands. And so what we did was we focused on, you know, bringing on additional acts that would have overlapping appeal. Bands like uh, uh, Bon Jovi tribute, right? I, I always say Bon Jovi is the intersection between Guns N' Roses and uh, and uh, Journey. Yeah. It's like somewhere in between. It's, it's you know, it's, it's got that boyish, bon, you know, Bon Jovi charm and really hooky tunes. But you know, Bon Jovi once you get past like you know the eight radio hits or whatever, it actually gets pretty heavy too sometimes. So. Um, so anyway, um, and that was the beginning. And from there, we just kept adding bands. And, and then from there, a lot of people just started forming tribute bands locally to get in on it. Or I got contacted by other bands. And if you fast forward to now, you know, I, I represent uh, probably 25 to 30 bands, both tribute and cover bands. Um, I book or promote over 500 shows a year. Um, and ended up launching a tribute band festival now going into its ninth year here, which is kind of the gold standard in the U S and that's for called tribute. hair fest, right? Hair fest. Yeah. yeah. H A R E. Right. Now, right. It's a play on words. Yeah. Uh, because my business partner owns the wild hair saloon, which is where we started the event. And that's, and, so, a, and you have so another cool. festival too, a country festival as well too. Yeah, which is which is really interesting in its own right because the country festival is not a tribute festival. Right. You know, my my partner Joan, who is really right in the center of the country music scene up here, which is not very robust compared to you know up here compared to other scenes, but 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 the fans are here, but they're dispersed, so they're not in Portland. They're all around the state. Yeah. Oregon's a very country state. So is Washington. Mm-hmm. Just not in the metropolitan. Yeah, place. I can understand that. <laughs> but Joan Joan had, had has always been a fan of Red Dirt. You know, so it's a subset. Of, it's, it's hard. I mean, in, in some ways, it's like more southern rock than country. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so Texas country, red dirt, Americana, outlaw country, you know, people who come from, you know, who hearken from the likes of Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson, um, you know, George Strait on the Texas side of things. And yeah. so we started this. But these what we did was we had the festival and we thought, well, it's a good time strategically to, to get into this because, these bands are storming the market. You know, Chris Stapleton, right, was like, a, uh, you know, seemed to come out of nowhere, right, and, and is huge, right? And he sort of proved that, that, that this, there's a room in this market for, for, for authentic country music. And so we started this in using the same infrastructure, site, crew, everything that we had for the Tribute Festival. So the two festivals are back to back, probably not unlike uh, – Stagecoach and Coachella, but obviously way smaller. So, in terms of of uh, time frame, they're they're very closely. They're they're no, they're one week apart. So oh, okay. We, we set up the site. Okay, so and, you, and you can stay up, set up. I got it. It stays up for two weeks, but we redress the site, so the the it feels pretty different from yeah. festival to festival because you know, like for example, last year at Hairfest we had a, a Ferris wheel that people could ride just for the fun of it. Well, then we take that out, and in its place goes a two step Texas two step dance floor. Yeah. Uh, so things like that. So, well, yeah. So that's really my first foray into not working with tribute bands at the national level. I've done lots of local music work with original bands, but I'd never gotten into the national artist scene. But like our headliner, Cody Johnson, his album went to number one on the Billboard country charts in January. Wow. wow. Um, and so it's just a completely different world and uh, that I've been, you know, let's been go. About. Let's go back backwards a little bit to Hairfest. Yeah, uh, because I had the opportunity to to spend some time on the website. And, and by the way, all your websites being a sort of a web connoisseur, uh, whatever the hell that is, I, <laughs> uh, I, I really found that your sites are really, really good. And, and I would oh, certainly geez. encourage, and we'll have a, 
a list of some of those sites on the episode page. But uh, Hairfest is a pretty is a pretty neat thing, and so I wanted to have you just kind of run through it a little bit. Tell us a little bit more about the details and how it's set up and how it works and and that sort of thing. Uh, because I imagine you're you're probably drawing not entirely from that area. I mean, you must have some people coming in from other areas as well, right? Uh, we've we figured out that we've had folks from about 20 states yeah. uh, over the years. Yeah. I mean, it is primarily a Northwest audience. We do have people who come in from Hawaii. We have a, mm-hmm. a couple that comes up from San Antonio every year. Yeah. Um, but the capacity is 6,000. So it's not huge. Um, and it fills up every year. So, yeah. you know, that's not a bad number, though. I mean, 6,000 no, no, is 6,000. <laughs> you know, and it's enough to um, it's enough to. Uh, it's big enough to have a really great festival vibe and be economically viable, but small enough to have a culture, yeah. um, which is really, really important with tribute bands, as, as, as we'll discuss. Um, you know, we started this event um, all, all, pretty much on a lark. Um, what had happened was Joan, who owns the Wild Hair Saloon, Joan Monin, she owns two Wild Hair Saloons. At the time, she had one in Canby, Oregon, which is about 25 minutes outside of Portland. It's a rural town, a uh, great community. And, uh, you know, my 80s band had played at her at her bar there um, the year before. So I guess it would have been 2009 and um, had a great time. And, and what we had played was she has this gathering of Canby High School class 80 through 89. So um, when she called the next year, she said, hey, I want to do this event again, but I'd love to have Stone and Love, your journey tribute come out. Well, at that point, Stone and Love, you know, cost three times as much as what she paid for our 80s band the year before. And it wasn't economically viable to do it inside her venue. The venue was too small. But what we did was rather than just not do it, we talked about it further and sort of brainstormed, well, how can we make this work? And what we decided was, well, let's just do it outside. She has a lot of property outside the wild here. Let's do it outside and we'll bring in the infrastructure and all that. And so um, we did it. We did it with three bands and we jokingly called it the 80s hair fest. And we had three bands, our Journey Tribute, our 80s band, and we had also had like a, a glam rock band, you know, like a, we called it Hair Assault, but, it, you know, sort of like a, a Steel Panther type of band. That was spelled differently, I imagine, huh? Hair Assault? Yeah, that was actual H-A-I-R. <laughs> and and, and from what you're describing, you must have been very busy at that. You, yeah, well, I wasn't in Hair Assault, but I was in the other two. Yeah, bands. that's what I mean. You were doing that and, and running <laughs> but, the thing probably, yeah. But that being said, as a first year festival, it wasn't nearly as crazy as it is now. Yeah. We have, but we had 600 people show up. It seems like 600 is like a magic number in my world. Um, but, but yeah, we had 600 people show up and just had a blast. Everything about it was awesome. And so from that point, we're like, we should really expand this and grow it. And so, uh, you know, the growth of Hairfest really maps the growth of the tribute scene here in the region. You know, the event has grown. We did it for four years at the Wild Hair. The problem was, is that there's nowhere for people to really spend the night out there. You know, all the hotels in the region are full. And, you know, so one of the impediments to growth was getting overnight options at the festival. So we moved it down about a mile and a half away to Pat's Acres Racing Complex, which is a really cool um, go-kart uh, oh. racing track. But it's not just go-karts. They do, like, drift racing and stuff like that. It gets, like, you know, professional. Yeah, yeah I've seen that. Yeah. And so, but they have a great, prop, beautiful property and it enabled us to add overnight camping and RVs. Ah. And so that's when the festival like really took off when all of a sudden everybody could come spend the night and we developed an overnight culture around the event. And, um, you know, it really played into our number one marketing strategy, sort of, you know, touching on the business side of this is that, you know, yes, the music needs to be great and the production needs to be great and you need to have these experience elements, but what's going to drive the tribute scene and what's going to drive this event is culture. And, you know, it's almost like summer camp to the point where now people look forward to seeing the other hair festers once a year. You know what I mean? Yeah. When they come back to hair fest. That's, In fact, a lot of people have told us, to, you know, we just call it summer camp for adults. Yeah. Uh, it's 21 and over, which is also a little bit odd for a festival. But it, 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 it's part of what allows it to work is that people come to the festival and it's like it's the one weekend of the year where you can cut loose and not worry about your kids or, you know. Um, I mean, the actually, uh, you know, the, the humorous thing about it is, you know, because the event's been around long enough, you know, a lot of these people were coming in their early 40s when they had kids who were in their early teens, right? Well, now that 10 years, nine years have passed, the kids are in their early 20s and the parents are in their 50s and they're all both coming. Yeah. So now it's like a family thing. We're like, yeah, we bring our whole family to Hairfest, but the family that's grown children. So we have a, a, a really rapidly growing 20 something demographic at Hairfest, which is surprising. Yeah, that's cool. Um, 
and a little bit of a hole in the middle. So not as many in the 30s because those people are into the 90s, which we don't do much at this. I have other 90s tribute events, um, but the demographic is very much in the 20s and you know maybe early 30s, and then it picks up again in the mid 40s. Um, so it's fascinating like that. Yeah. Uh, but the event, it, the event itself has evolved. I mean, without going through the entire evolution, I'll give you some of the highlights. That yeah, that'd be great. Um, one of the things that's cool is that pe- we 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 uh, we have a station where people can get their hair done for free. Oh, so um, and that would be spelled that would be spelled H A I R. But it would be fun if you yeah. just spelled it the other way. Correct. Yeah, yeah. It's always a. You know, it's kind of funny too because we're like, well, what should we call this? Because <laughs> right. you know, we, we, you know, um, at, you know, because we call it the 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 big hair station. Oh. So people get their hair done up eighty style, like big eighty. Oh, haircuts. that's cool. That's so cool. it's cool. Like the whole property of people just walking around with crazy hair. So Is it like a big salon or something? Portable salon or something? Or? That's exactly right. Yeah, it has been. It, for the first several years, we had the Paul Mitchell School. Wow, uh, that's cool. So we had students, hair students, coming out and doing. It. And then last year we had Bishop's uh, Barber sh- Shop, which is, has a big, you know, it's a big franchise up here. And, uh, I'm not sure how it's going to shake out this year, but we always have it and people love it. In the past, we connected that to what we call the photo stage, which was basically a miniature replica of the main stage with lights and everything. And they could go up there and we had backline up on the stage and they would take, you know, they get all up, you know, gussied up with their hair and everything. They go on stage and take pictures like they were that band's playing. This is the first year we're not going to have the photo stage because we're actually going to make that second stage active with bands. Oh, so, okay. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Kind of, I think I saw yeah. that on the map. I did see a smaller second stage that's uh, yeah. So that back. stage has always been there, but it was actually just the, really a, a really expensive photo booth. I got it. I got <laughs> uh, it. But but it, at the country festival last year, we had to rethink our production scheme because at Hairfest we've always only had 15 minutes between bands and one stage, so the bands would all sound check in advance. Well, you can't do that with national acts. That's just not going to fly. So instead, we had two stages running and it works so well. There's no downtime between sets. You know, one finishes and the second it's done, the next one starts. So um, we're doing that this year. So we, we, we're doing it with Hairfest. Actually, we have three stages this year. So imagine you arrive at the event and outside the main venue, we call it the field stage. And there's actually an outdoor stage where you can, there's a beer garden and food and vendors. And it starts at 1130 um, on Saturday morning. Um, so people can enjoy that all through the day. And then when the venue opens up at four, they come in there two more stages. So we have, uh, 22 bands in, uh, wow. less, in less than 48 hours. Wow. And, uh, yeah. and actually, actually really in, uh, in less than, uh, in probably in about 30 hours, we have 22 bands. It's crazy. Just nonstop. Do you have to set up the whole infrastructure from scratch? Yes. There's nothing there. In fact, they don't even have, they don't even have running water that we can use. Really? Wow. Yeah. So we have to bring in a water truck. I mean, yeah, n- power. And lots uh, of porta potties probably too, huh? Yeah. Wi-Fi, <laughs> porta potties, you know, freezer, you know, things you don't think about, like you got to keep your ice cold for liquor. Um, so you got a lot of generators probably, huh? Yeah. A lot of generators. Um, we have this massive overhead shade installation that you can see in our pictures um, that, that helps. That was the other thing too. Our first year there, like the sun, we didn't know what the sun was going to do. Um, but it was blazing hot and the area right in front of the stage was just sweltering. It was right in the musician's eyes. And so like everyone was in a horseshoe around the outside of the venue, just trying to get away from the sun until the sun went down. So Joan and I were looking at that saying, you know what, whatever we do next year, and this was back in year five, we have to have that area in front of the stage be the absolute most comfortable place in the venue because we want everybody up there rocking all weekend long. So we found this uh, company Guildworks up here, which does these amazing overhead shade installations. They're not cheap. But man, it's worth every cent, and uh, and it, it creates this really cool shade cover. Not only is it beautiful, but it also creates a, a wind tunnel, you know, kind of underneath there. So now, being up in front, rocking out, is the absolute most comfortable place for both musicians and fans to be all weekend long. It's awesome. And there's no seating there, right? It's unless nope. you bring it, right? You can bring your own chairs, and there's a line by which you have to keep your chairs behind them. And it works really well. Um, you know, people, you know, they come in there, they set up their chairs, and kind of set up a little home base. Um, and they can do blankets and things like that. You now, know, is it plenty. floor grass or dirt or what is it? It's grass. Okay, yeah, it's so grass. That's, that helps. Not yeah. dirt is. And actually, that was another thing that our old venue, you know, the field had, you know, it just wasn't suitable for um, blankets. You know, there was like little shards of glass in there oh, for many. Years. Yeah, but it was. Did it you was have like a, you have to, your, your, your insurance bill? There. Yeah, your insurance. Yeah, we've we'll probably been there for twenty years. You know, what <laughs> I mean, it was one of those things where you. If you were digging around, you'd find it, but it wasn't like necessarily an issue. Yeah. But it was like, well, we weren't going to allow people to put a blanket down on it. We had, you could bring chairs, but not blankets. So anyway, it's nice to have legitimate grass to do that with. 
Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about uh, the extra features. Uh, tell me a bit about the overnight and the camping and how does all that work? Yeah, well, it's pretty cool. So this year it's kind of cool because you can actually reserve a specific RV space. Like you have a map and you can actually select like, I want this RV space. Now we, we have 131 reserved RV spaces and those sold out like like a couple months ago, like they sold out within two months. Yeah. And then after that, we have another 60 overflow RV spaces and those are already half sold out. So we have about 200 RV spaces all together. They always sell out and the RV people are a hoot, man. They just have this big camp out there in the RV. It's just a sea of RVs. And then the tent camping actually takes place on the racetrack. Oh, really? And so the cool, and so the cool thing about that, cause the racetrack has, on the, they don't camp on the pavement, Sure. but all, all around the pavement, there's all these grassy areas and it's huge. And so it's cool about it. it's like a little neighborhood because people set up their tents on the grass and whatnot, and they aren't limited to like a ten by ten space. You know, it's like there's enough space that you just you just go find your spot and set up your camp with your friends, and you're not trying to cram everything into a little ten by ten. And then the, the it's like a little neighborhood, and you can get around uh, using it on the pavement. So the pavement just has you know sit your chairs out there or something. So and people set up like cornhole games and whatever, and they're they're out there um, on the campsite. You know, and people don't hang out in the campsite during the concert because you can't see it from there. But that's a big part of the culture. And then on top of that, we always have some kind of extra feature. Last year was a Ferris wheel. Um, and in years past, we've had the photo stage. Um, and then I'll, we also have a misting tent for, for misting. Oh, um, go in and get a little misty. Yeah. yeah exactly. What's the special feature for this year? Have you figured it out yet? We have not announced it yet, actually. It's, we're keeping it under wraps. Yeah. But you know what it is, right? Well, we know what it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we can't break we, that. Fact, we can't break that news. And it's a super fun <laughs> surprise. Or something like that. But it's always something different. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. And, and then, um, but there are other things too, like, uh, you know, another thing that people do is they like to bedazzle their hair fest merch. So we have a, we sell an incredible amount of festival merchandise, interesting, uh, contrast, right. To the country festival, the country festival, we sell a lot more artist merchandise, right. And we have a lot of artist merchandise, um, at, at the hair fest, but, but we sell a, a lot of hair fest merch there, way more than artist merch. So it's interesting contrast. Uh, but then people will like make their own versions of it. So it's always cool to see like the, the, what people show up with, with their sort of customized hair fest stuff. We have sponsors who make their own shirts for their, their companies. You know what I mean? Um, things like that. Yeah. So, um, uh, it's, uh, and, it's, and then yeah. the, the other thing that's really, I mean, I think the most important thing though, to get back to is that we, when in tribute bands, you want people to suspend disbelief, you know, to have some sense that they're, I mean, no one's ever going to think I'm seeing the real band. I mean, you know, it's a tribute band, no matter how authentic they are, but you'd like them to forget that. Yeah. So in order to do that, you've got to have really great sound and lights to go along with these great bands. And so the people who do our production, they play way above the rim. I mean, we have the person who used to do lights for the huge Sasquatch festival up here when that was going on. These guys do all the professional grade concerts up here. They're just amazing. And so it's like, I mean, we're really lucky to have this team from True West because they're one of the Northwest top concert promoters in general. Um, and so, you know, they their festival expertise is is, is, is so invaluable. Um, but the production is next level. And so, I mean, our only limitation on lighting is how much the stage will handle. Yeah. That's our limitation, like how much weight we can put on the stage. Yeah, I've seen some of the photos and I mean, in. I think there's some video too of it as, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, the, the, yeah. the and so we think that you know people have commented like, wow, man, I don't see this kind of production at most of the regular concerts I go to unless I'm going to a stadium or a, or a, you know, in the Rose Garden. But it's it's really good. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, what's the cost? What kind of? How do you sell the tickets? Are there different packages? And what's the cost range? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, um, you know, it's funny. I should be able to just spit that out off the top. You of my should, head. and but I'm not going to hold you to it. Yeah, but basically <laughs> the. The festival pass, right, which includes camping. I mean, technically, overnight camping is free, but there's only but the overnight the, the festival pass is the only pass that allows you re-entry during the concert, which you would need to go back and forth to your campsite. Got it. So that one is a hundred and forty nine dollar ticket for the weekend. That's not bad. No, it's not bad. And, and then, um, or you can get individual day tickets. The Friday ticket is forty nine dollars, and the Saturday ticket is fifty seven. So if you weren't spending the night. You can go both days, uh, you know, for 106 bucks. What's the parking lot? So people can drive in and park and just go to yeah, it? Yeah, parking and then... is $10 a night. What kind of parking. capacity do you have there for parking? Uh, well, we haven't reached it yet. Okay. Thousands. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Sounds um, good. Yeah. And then like the RV parking pass, um, 
is uh, I'm sorry. Actually, the festival pass is 147. The RV parking pass is 149 for the weekend. Got it. Um, and then we have we have a VIP add-on, so you can buy a VIP add-on, which gets you into a really large VIP section that has you know liquor and seating and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and then we have um, we have a, a military discount, veterans discount. So oh, that's cool. That's uh, nice. Yeah. So for the for the festival pass, you can save like twenty nine bucks or yeah. twenty eight bucks. Yeah. Um, get it for one nineteen for that. So we also have that. And there's a lot of military folks up there, isn't there? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, it's it's just a nice thing to do. You know, all things considered. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, it's amazing, and I would certainly encourage uh, our listeners to to take it's hair fest. Dot com. Do I have that right, or is it? Yeah, but H A R E. Yeah, like as in rabbits, Wild right? Hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although if you type, if you do, if you Google hair fest, you'll even if you spell it wrong, you'll find it. Yeah, it, I would take a look. It's a it's a rin. If you're you know if that's your thing and you're you're in the Northwest, you can make it uh, to the Northwest. When is it's in this summer, right? It's June or something. Yeah, July twelfth okay. and thirteenth is July. the hair July. fest this year, and then the following weekend is the Wild Hair Country Fest. And what's the, the website for that? Uh, wildhaircountryfest.com. Okay. Like, just like it sounds. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would take a look at that. And if I was going to be in the area, I'd, uh, I would certainly be, uh, taking a look at it, but let me, uh, let me just switch gears a little bit, uh, because you'd mentioned your interest in, you know, education and helping others in the business sort of realize their own goals and, and you work with these bands and you work with other musicians and that sort of thing. So tell me a little bit about your philosophy there and what you're trying to do uh, to help out. Yeah. So one of the realizations uh, in getting into the business side of music, which, you know, I mean, it probably should have been obvious. And I think people who are in music for a long time already knew this. But musicians are often not that good at business in large part because they're naturally different skill sets. You know, yeah. um, if you if you subscribe to this left and right brain idea, then you know, you might say business is maybe a little bit more on the left, although there is lots of creativity in business. So I don't want to. Um, but, you know, whereas the musicians tend to be pretty much, you know, a lot, a lot of right brain type of folks. So one of the things I started doing with the tribute bands, you know, I, I have venues where I'm like, I know the band's going to sell out no matter what happens. Right. You know, if I go into a 300 capacity venue with a, with a, with a good show, it will sell out. And so it created an interesting opportunity where I could um, have the opening band be a local original band. So I started doing is pairing local original bands with tribute bands. So, for example, if our Beastie Boys tribute plays, uh, a great example is I have a show coming up on April 420, right? 420. I have the Beastie Boys (laughs) tribute uh, playing a show. They're headlining, but the two bands that are are on the bill with them are both local uh, original hip hop acts, and they're outstanding. And so... um, in doing that, I eventually had built enough relationships with local bands that I took on the project of doing a local music festival with solely original music. I did it for two years. And the, the second year I did it, we had 80 bands, 13 venues across in two days. Wow. Yeah, it was really something. It was a really a great experience to do it. I, I didn't. The last time I did it was 2017. Okay. Um, I didn't make any money doing it. I, I lost money, but I, I lost a lot of money the first year and barely any the second year. But it was never about the money. Sure. It was about can I use what I've, can I use the the benefit that I've gotten from the tribute bands, you know, to help me essentially maybe do my part to help fuel the next batch of bands to which there will maybe be tributes to someday, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, it, you know, sort of a circle of life kind of thing. With was music. there, what was the result of the second year? I mean, were there any uh, sort of uh, residual benefits that you could uh, see uh, yeah. from that? Well, one of the things, yeah. So to, to complete the circle here with, with, with the, with the music festival, you know, I knew we needed to have a local local um, promotion, um, you know, plan that 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 had the musicians involved, right? But you know, in the old school way of doing these kinds of things, is the promoter would hand a bunch of tickets to the musicians and say, "You want to get paid? Go sell these." And you know, I have always thought that that was really it didn't make any sense because because it basically said, "Hey, I'm going to take the least qualified people to market this show <laughs> and ask them to market this show," yeah. right? <laughs> If you believe the musicians suck at business, which most promoters do, why would you have them go do this? You know what I mean? So I, I took a different approach. I'm like, well, I don't think musicians are lazy, and I think that they're smart. I think that they just don't have the knowledge. And so rather than do the here's the tickets approach, we I uh, launched with uh, our local um, 
periodical uh, Vortex Music Magazine here, an amazing supporter of local music here in Portland and the Northwest. And together we launched a program of free education series. And the idea was that let's just arm musicians, let's just make them better business people or give them the opportunity by giving them a forum that's comfortable and free and excessive because musicians, you know, you shouldn't be making money on music, trying to educate musicians. They don't have any money. It doesn't make any sense. You know, musicians aren't my customer. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, we launched this program and we've been doing it now for since 2015, the first MOGO. So now we're into it for four years now. We've been doing it and we do three to four of them a year and it's a free series. We get a panel of really great experts and we do everything from topics on, um, you know, music licensing, concert promotion, booking tours, um, dealing with contracts, managing your band. I mean, so many different things. That, and we've, the feedback has been amazing. The turnouts are you know, a couple hundred people come to these things each month. It's great networking for musicians. A lot of people have, you know, met other musicians that they can now do shows with together. You know, they, so things like that. And so I found that to be really rewarding um, program. And even though I'm not doing that much with original artists, with local original artists, I still love doing it because it's just a great way to create a connection between the success we're having with tribute bands and, you know, the overall sort of future of, of the local music scene here. That's a that's a monthly thing that's still going on. It's, qu- it's quarterly. It's oh, quarterly, quarterly. quarterly. Yeah. And, and what kind of a venue do you use with it or? Is yeah, it- we've actually been fortunate enough to uh, use the Doug Fur Lounge. It's uh, one of the top 100 music venues in the country. It's just a beautiful venue. It's a 300 capacity venue, but it's just a super nice place. And they've given me a really sweet deal allowing us to do these. We do them on Sundays. Yeah, that's, them, that, like, that makes one, sense. One to, one to 4 p.m. Sure. So the musician gets enough time to sleep in after their Saturday night gig. Yep. But they're not, you know, no one's gigging for, well, I shouldn't say nobody, but most people aren't gigging from one to four on a Sunday. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and we've started partnering um, with uh, Audio Globe, another company here to, we start, we start uh, webcasting them as well. And all of it's free to the public. So that is, that's awesome. And uh, yeah. is that, uh, is there a, a place where people can get more information about that? Or? Yeah. I always point them to, to the Vortex uh, music magazine website. And if you just, you know, Google Vortex, uh, I think cause it's, it's a weird, it's VTRX or VRTX. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, if you just do Vortex music magazine, Portland, you'll find it. Yeah. Um, and they have uh, they have an archive. And the other thing that's cool, too, is there's a, there's companion pieces that go with it. So, for example, Vortex does uh, a little you know a blurb in the magazine, like a full page deal where they interview the panelists in advance and do some Q&A. So if there's also a piece of that that's in the uh, that's in the magazine. And then there's a podcast that also happens. Um, it's the podcast here called The Future of What on X-Ray FM um, with Portia Sabin uh, from Kill Rockstars, a very successful uh, independent label here in Portland. Um, that uh, also does a podcast a interview, uh, much like we're doing now. Yeah, that's uh, right. In advance, in advance of the series, and so all that together creates a nice vortex of knowledge. See what I did there? Yeah, uh, good. So yeah, it's really exactly. people love it, and it's it's really nice just to be doing something that doesn't have a dollar sign attached to it. To be honest, well, it's you're yeah. giving back, and it's part of the service uh, element that uh, you know we should all be doing for all kinds of. It's uh, really good fun. Reasons. It's really fun, and you meet some fascinating people and the panelists. I mean, I you know aside from everything else, I'm also a student, you know, so I learn. I I, I moderate the panels, and. Uh, you know, you just walk out of there with so many ideas. So, yeah, just just goes to show, too, that I'm sure you've learned this with with the breadth of musicians and folks that you've had on your series here that, you know, there's just something to learn from everybody. And it's not always the thing you expect. You're you're so right. Exactly right. Uh, let me ask you a, a little broader as we kind of come toward the, the last part of the interview. I always like to kind of get a little perspective on things. And, and as you look you know, across the horizon of business in general, the business that you're in or involved in or connected to or whatever, where do you see future opportunities as well as potentially some challenges? Well, for I'm going to answer that in two parts. For tribute bands in particular, um, the dynamics are interesting because of where we are relative to the legacy acts that are touring right now. So, you know, one thing I'm always mindful about being in a tribute band is I never want to position us as, hey, we compete with the real thing, right? Because we don't. Yeah. Um, and it's actually a very different product. I, a good example would be is if you go and see, uh, you know, a band perform now, I, let me back up. Let, I'm going to use Guns N' Roses as an example, right? If you go to a Guns N' Roses show and, and GNR decides to tune a song down a couple of steps and, and play a, a, a new version of it that they hadn't done that doesn't sound like the album, 
you know, you might leave that concert and go, oh, man, it was so cool. They did the GNR did this really cool version of Welcome to the Jungle. It was just really cool, you know, acoustic or whatever, right? And you're like, sweet, right? You go see a tribute band do the same thing, and you're like, what the heck? Yeah. These guys don't sound anything like – so tribute bands have a unique burden. A tribute band has to be better live than the original band ever was. And the reason why is because the standard by which they're being judged is the album recording. And we know that bands, especially from the late 70s through the 80s, a lot of what was done on recording cannot be recreated that, live with a lot right. of that's extra. Right. Yeah. And it was never a burden that the real band had. And so – but one of the things that's happening – I had a fascinating conversation with uh, someone who does uh, talent buying uh, for really one of the lar- uh, you know one of the largest talent buying entities you know around for fairs and uh, state fairs and county fairs and that thing. And, you know, they seem to think that the tide is shifting towards tribute bands because what's happening is that buyers are paying, you know, a premium for orig- the original band that may only have one or no original members. <laughs> so they're starting to ask the question, like, well, wait a minute, I can pay, you know, seventy thousand or you know, fifty to seventy thousand dollars for this legacy act, or I can get a tribute band for seven thousand, five to seven thousand dollars, you know, for ten percent of that, and have the, and have a, 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 a comparable, if not better, performance. And the same number of original members. And so the the fairs are, are starting to make I mean, that's just one indication. Yeah. The other one is a little more obvious, which is that and I don't want to sound morbid, but a lot of these artists are either retired or they've passed away. You know, Tom Petty, uh, Soundgarden. I mean, you know, David Bowie, the list goes on. And once that happens, the only opportunity you have to really experience this, the, the the joy of that music is through a cover or a tribute band. It wasn't really uh, the the original, if I can remember correctly, it wasn't really the Elvis people that were really kind of got this thing going. I mean, in a very yeah, early yeah, totally. Stage. I think the rat, the Rat Pack type tributes, you know, the the classic Vegas shows. Yeah. Um, you know, whether it's Elvis, the the Bette Midler, the Frank Sinatra. You know, yeah, those were, that's right. That, that was kind of the beginning. And they still, if you go to Vegas, I mean, these guys, there's still a lot of that. I mean, Justin Shandor uh, lives here. He's one of the the, the most nationally rec- internationally recognized Elvis uh, impersonators. Totally cool guy and a, a mind-blowing Elvis. Um, but, you know, he's he's just as busy as he ever was, you know. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so and, – and we're seeing more Vegas residencies for tribute bands and things like that. So I think in the tribute business um, – that's happening. The other one is that there's an evolution of tribute scenes. So on the one hand, the bands like, um, you know, the rock bands, you know, sort of, which is the, the centerpiece of my world, you know, you know, the, my softest tribute is the Eagles, which is also one of my easiest to book, you know, journey Eagles are the easiest to book, but then, um, you've got a, a whole batch of nineties bands that are coming online and, um, they don't mesh. This is interesting. The audience of nineties shows don't, they don't mesh with the eighties shows. They have I, a different yeah, I can imagine that, yeah. but, but, but there's a, still a huge market for it. So I think that's the other evolution too, is that I think there will be an increasing number of opportunities for these, you know, seventies, eighties tributes, um, in places that might have used nationals in the past. And then I think you're going to see nineties tributes just kind of pop up more on the club scene and in festivals and things as well as that audience is able to go out. That's really, really, really interesting. Uh, is there, is there anything that, that we need to be concerned about? I mean, do you see any pitfalls or p- potential yes. uh, bumps yes, in the road? Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. The number one uh, dilemma for tribute bands is that because they're so lucrative and so fun, everybody wants to do it. And so as with any type of market, when it gets saturated with product, it throws supply and demand out of whack. But what makes it worse is that they're you know, 99% of the tribute bands out there, candidly, are terrible. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so because of that, you know, that the more terrible tribute bands there are out there, the more that's going to color the market's perception of what a tribute band is. Yeah. And um, there's nothing that I or anybody else can do about it other than just to put our best foot forward. But um, it, it's, it's a reality of it. Um, and it also, you know, part of the reason that I'm, you know, if you look at the evolution of my business, which I know is kind of the other half of where this question is going, is that, you know, I am, you know, having increasingly less reliance on tribute bands specifically and focusing more on events that utilize tribute bands, but that the events are more thematically driven. So, for example, we do the 80s weekend at the Crystal Ballroom. I do Flannel Fest, which is a 90s rock tribute event. I do the Aladdin Tribute Series, which is a series of tribute shows at one of our favorite theaters here in town where it's all ages. So a little more program based um, a little more event based as opposed to, you know, hey, here's a tribute show and, and as a one off, you know, more theming typing events and, and those types of things. So um, that helps to to 
create loyalty more to you know to the event as opposed to just the band and it helps insulate me from you know oversaturation of tribute bands even if there's a tribute band on every corner there's still only one hair fest well i think that's really smart and you're right uh you've been you're established now so you have an advantage a big advantage over a lot of other people sort of trying to to get into it so you'll always have that doesn't mean that doesn't guarantee anything but i think the fact that you're diversifying and that you're that you're building an organization and a structure that's designed to be able to withstand a piece of it kind of starting to go south if it does well, uh, it, it inevitably, yeah, it, it inevitably, like, you know, if I if I did nothing and I just kind of kept doing the same thing, you know, I would get swallowed up by the market. You know, it would just be it would be so competitive that it would drive the price down to nothing. My competitive advantage, while the bands I have are awesome, my competitive advantage is that I, I've developed a really large uh, a following or a scene or an audience that I'm connected to that I can um, reach out to and connect with for shows and things that, you know, if you're a touring band coming through, you just don't get. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, Portland's, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like a, it's, it's a little bit of a monopoly in a way. Um, just because you know, if you're going to play locally, you, you pretty much have to have the support of the tribute scene in order to do well at a show. Yeah. Um, yeah. well, that's, you know, a, that, that's, uh, I mean, it just makes, it makes an awful lot of sense. I want to, uh, kind of conclude just by asking you what I almost always ask everybody is the simple question what is the future for jason fellman yeah i mean i don't you know it's a really interesting thing i'm 46 you know this is my second business um my first business it, it was successful enough that it you know it took the pressure off of anything else i do from here on out uh, so you know for me i see a couple of different things one of them is that i i really only have one more professional goal that's unmet which is that old write a book um, and so, uh, I can tell you with, you know, assuming my health, you know, allows me to do it. I can speak with relative confidence that, you know, sometime in the next five to 10 years, I'm going to have a book. Um, and, you know, I'll start speaking on that, you know, you know, focusing on, uh, cause I used to do a lot of public speaking in my original business where I'd speak at conferences on the topics of interactive marketing and social media and those types of things. And so, um, you know, I envision doing that. I don't envision that being necessarily a music focused book though. It's probably going to be a little bit more about my philosophy on entrepreneurship. You know, I've always, uh, it's a little bit of a, of, a, of a departure here, but I think it's important for people who are trying to be successful to really realize that there's, a, there's actually a really nice space between failure and success. You know what I mean? And I, I think that oftentimes we get hung up on, you know, I, it's like, I don't like goal setting. I hate the idea of setting goals because you're just setting yourself up for failure. It's like, what if I don't meet those goals? Yeah. Does that mean I'm not successful? Yeah, that's exactly I believe right. in I I believe in directions, not goals. So, you know, I, I think about in terms of um, you know being able to to help uh, folks realize that the happiest place to be might not be hugely successful. Everybody knows that being unsuccessful sucks, right? So I don't need to paint that picture. But I've always said like you know rather than be underwater, like I don't want to be underwater, and I don't want to soar high in the sky. I want to hover nicely over the water and make sure I stay there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Great, um, great you, know, you just need to be, you need to be better off than everybody else, but not up in the 1%, you know, and I mean that both financially and other ways. And I realize that musicians can look at it a little bit differently because obviously you want to get a hit song or all that. You want to get to number one. So I get that. I don't want to disparage that. But I think what I mean is to not judge yourself based on whether or not you become the, you know, a rock star or, you know, get the number one country song or, have a, the biggest, you know, festival or whatever it is, is that there's, there's actually a, you know, I, I like the way my life is. I own my time. I'm the master of my own destiny. I can do whatever I want. When I negotiate, I never have to worry about it because if I don't like it, I just walk away. Um, it's really empowering. And I don't, I don't have the burden of assets. You know, I'm not rich. I'm, I'm financially independent, you know, but I'm not, you know, I don't have a big house. I mean, actually I do have a big house, but not like fancy, you know what I mean? It's just, it's an old house. Um, but you know what I mean? So sure. it's like, yeah. You know, not a lot of maintenance. I don't have a bunch of bills. Well, I drive used cars. You know, you know, you've you've uh, articulated uh, some ideas that I have frequently talked about on this show, and that we talked about in our earlier conversation. One of them uh, that didn't we say the same thing using different words, but I was talking about the perils of the expectation game, and a lot of times we we do set up uh, fairly narrow expectations of a lot of different things. And you're right. I mean, we set ourselves up for, you know, at the very least disappointment, 
but oftentimes something we think of as as failure. So better off to live in what I learned many years ago from a friend of mine in the expectancy of the best possible result and just move toward it. So, uh, you know, that reminds me of a saying, I, I don't know who said it. It's, it's always been in my head and I bet that someone said it, but I just don't know who. Uh, but the, the, uh, the road to success is paved with failure. You know, that, that was the other thing, you know, if I was going to, if I was going to say a couple of things, you know, to folks about like, you know, things that like the, some of the hardest, le- the biggest lessons, right. Of all this journey that I've been on from my original business to my current business is that one, like getting used to the idea of failing really helps. Because once you once you've realized that failure just it just creates opportunities left and right, whether you learn from it or whether it opens another door, you know, but it's like it, it, it's a, it's really an empowered feeling to completely screw up and go, oh, man, bummer. But oh, oh, well, well, I won't do that again. Well, there's another way to to uh, to deal with that. And I'll just make this an add on. Uh, and I've talked about it on this show on on several occasions that uh, many years ago from the same friend that I've I've learned a lot of stuff from, I sort of eliminated the word failure uh, and just basically took all those things and put them into a folder called R&D. Yeah, I love it. (laughs) And because really, that's exactly what you're saying. In my view, that's what it is. And we tend to associate failure with something really bad and uh, we carry it around with us and, uh, you know, refer to it frequently, which is great for self-esteem and all that kind of stuff. Uh, But, um, you know, if you just it doesn't matter how you do it, but essentially what you're talking about, what I'm talking about is uh, to not dwell on that, to take take the, the things you learn from it as a positive thing can't change it, can't change anything that's already happened, but you can move forward, you know, with the knowledge uh, that you gain from that. And that's, that's pretty basic stuff. But uh, you've had a lot of, a lot of interesting things to say today. And this has been an interview that uh, I knew would be good going in, but it's turned out even better. So I didn't have any expectations other than I thought it would be good. So if I had them, I certainly would have exceeded them. So I really do oh, appre- I appreciate. I really appreciate you taking the time on fairly short notice, you know, to come on the show and uh, and share this. And now we're going to have to stay in touch because I know you're doing all kinds of neat stuff, and uh, you know, I certainly want to hear about it and, uh, and see, see what you're doing. You know, so- you know when uh, when uh, when Jennifer Batten uh, uh, makes a referral. Uh, I, I, uh, I listen. <laughs> well, I, and I, pre- I appreciate her. And, you know, most of, mo- not all, but most of the guests that we have on the show do come from referrals from other yeah, people well, that have really been on the cool show. Program. I've, yeah. That's actually been the coolest outgrowth of this is getting to learn about your program. I got to go back and listen to some of the past. Episodes. You know, there's a lot of, you know, I have to admit there's uh, without patting myself on the back, it's kind of hurts my shoulder a little bit, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, there's a lot of good stuff. There. There's a lot of, uh, um, this is the 58th episode. Uh, we've just launched another one that's uh, kind of an offshoot from this uh, called GBR Focus. It's all about products and companies. And, you know, hopefully there'll be more stuff to come. But again, thank you so much for coming on. And I know we'll talk again later. Yeah, much appreciated. You got it. So what did you think of the interview with Jason Fellman? We always want to hear from you. You can do that easily through the official episode page on our website at guitarbusinessradio.com or on Facebook and Twitter at Guitar Business or just email us directly at contact at guitarbusinessradio.com. And of course, if none of that's working for you, just call us on our GBR hotline at 888 888- 777-2404. You can do that right now if you like, or later. Operators are still on strike and management personnel are busy making work for themselves, so it's possible that I might actually have to answer the phone. But hey, it could be a lot worse. So, what a great interview that was. And I have to be honest with you, we originally had somebody else scheduled for this episode. I won't mention his name because I don't want to embarrass anybody or reveal personal information that could be taken the wrong way. So we'll we'll just say that at the last minute, it did not work out. Now, I could have gotten irritated about this and waste a lot of precious time and energy. But frankly, folks, I just don't do that anymore. I just keep going, you know, toward the destination, which in this case was getting episode 58 out by Wednesday. And I talk a lot about keeping the options open on getting where you need to go, 
But that does not mean you sit back and wait for the roast duck to fly into your mouth. You have to be proactive, but you must be peaceful. And sometimes you just have to be patient. And that itself can take some effort, but it pays off. I did what I needed to do. I emailed and called around to book somebody else. It always works, except this time. I got nothing, but I kept moving, kept the options open, stayed peaceful, exercised patience. And then it happened, unexpected as it often is. An email showed up from Jennifer Batten, out of the blue. And from halfway around the world, she's telling me I need to contact this guy, Jason Fellman in Portland. He's got a great business in the Pacific Northwest, working with tribute bands and producing festivals and all kinds of stuff. So I looked at his websites and what he was doing. I was impressed, arranged a phone call almost immediately. The call confirmed what I was thinking. We set up the interview and the rest is history. It's Wednesday and another episode of GBR is on the air, so to speak. So here's the deal, folks. This is how it almost always goes. It happens so often that when things feel like they're going south or they're just not going, I know that usually it just means that something else even better is trying to break through. And that should be your cue to let it happen and be mindful of it. So if you find something like that going on with you, all I can say is stay positive, stay focused on your destination or destinations, but remember, keep all the options open on how you're going to get there. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you again on episode 59. And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com.